Happy Saturday morning, and we say a good morning to one and all. I look at the old clock right here. It says 8.06, six minutes after the hour. Welcome to all those people listening on uh, BizTalk Radio. Thank you for listening. Those on Facebook Live, you are live. We are live. It is uh, two days after Thanksgiving. We do hope that you had a blessed Thanksgiving and are, are full and uh, making uh, part of your weekend part of us here on Garden America. Part of your weekend, part of us on Garden America. I wonder what, I wonder what um, people what harvested means. for Thanksgiving. <laughs> what that mean? That's why I repeated it twice. Uh. Part well, of you, part of us, here on Garden America. <laughs> now, what about Harvest, uh, the Tiger? The third time was the charm. Let's move on. <laughs> you know, there's the there's the people that actually grow their food for Thanksgiving. So I wonder what it was that they they grew. If you if you would grow something for Thanksgiving dinner, what would you grow? You know, the first thing that comes to mind is, why did I think corn? Corn? You, no, really? Yeah. That was the first well, thing? It, it is, but then I thought, <laughs> no, I, I didn't even have corn for Thanksgiving. <laughs> I know. Who has corn for Thanksgiving? We call it maize. <laughs> um, I don't know. There, there's somebody with green a suggestion beans? behind me. Green beans. I guess green maybe. beans, maybe. Yeah. No, it's yeah. too late for too green, late, right? Beans. Right. You so, would grow. You could grow sweet potatoes. Uh, sweet potatoes, are another one, right? Right. It, possibly S- squash. Squash. Winter That's the squash. one that I'm thinking of. A squash. Yeah. Something Winter with squash. a squash. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then you can have it for Thanksgiving. You know, the pumpkins, the squashes. Yes. Turkey, well, Brian. You grow your turkeys, don't you? Well, we used to. Until that that accident, <laughs> but uh, yeah, welcome. It's uh, th- like I said, two days after Thanksgiving. I ate a lot of leftovers yesterday. Did you? I had turkey sandwiches with mayo and pepper. Uh, the dressing, the uh, yeah, we, I'm polishing it off. I had really? some turkey on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Go ahead. I know there's something more to this. No, it was the first time in six years almost oh. that I've. Now, could you I taste it? Turkey. Spit it right back out. No, I uh, I think I ate. Three small pieces, and then the fourth one tasted kind of bad, so yeah. that was it. But at least I ate it. There you go. So you with family? Would, yeah, we we did the. I don't remember if I mentioned this. We did the Tom Ham's Lighthouse. Oh, you mentioned that you were going. How was that? Buffet. How was that brunch? Excellent, excellent. We were right there on the water. Yeah, we had all that we can eat. No dishes to wash. No dishes to wash. Did Nothing you get to pumpkin pie. Up. Got with pumpkin whipped pie. Cream. Whipped cream. Yep. Yeah. Pecan pie. Oh, apple pie. pie. Chocolate bread pudding. I'm a Cool Whip Vanilla guy. ice cream. I've got to have Cool Whip on my pies. Really? Yes. Cool Whip? Love Cool Whip. Really? It's hydrogenated oil, right? Yeah. It's yeah, something, I... but it doesn't taste good. <laughs> well, I know it's chemical, <laughs> but it tastes, I think it no tastes way. great. Oh, come on. You like, what are you, a whipped cream guy? Yeah. Whipped cream yeah. all the way. Yeah, ready whip? Yo, man. That is spectacular. I, I got to have my cool. I know, I know it's it's. I, this should be an intervention. I understand. Yeah. But I love my cool. Cool whip, cool whip to me is like a um, miracle whip. It's not a miracle. I I agree. It's one of the things they'll find <laughs> after the mayo. apocalypse with uh, cockroaches. <laughs> yeah, that we're still living. Still cool around. whip and miracle whip. The, the yeah. people around after after the apocalypse are people who eat cool whip, <laughs> um, cockroaches, mm-hmm. right, and Keith Richards. Yeah. There you go. Right. What what's the saying? You know, I'm not worried about me, but what kind of world are we going to leave for Keith Richards? <laughs> anyway, welcome one and all. That's our monologue as yeah. as we kick things off on this we uh, Saturday. Santa Ana winds. Up what's up with the winds Brook. and what's oh up with stuff gosh. blowing over, John? It, it, the winds were the strongest in years. I, I, I mean, I still don't have my yard picked up. I picked up a lot of stuff yesterday, but, you know, there's no point during the winds because it'll just, <laughs> just fall down right again. Well, that was like me on I, Saturday thinking, oh, I got to go in the patio and start sweeping up. Yeah. I'm like, wait a minute. Hold on here. It's the, still blowing. People come into the nursery and there's things all blown. And they're nice and they pick things up and stand yeah. it up. I'm like, oh, please, please don't. don't. Yeah, yeah don't it's just going to fall down again. And then things, something breaks. You know? Do you remember when you were over at my house? Uh, I don't know if you can recall, but on the back porch mm-hmm. uh, was that big begonia. Yep. I remember that one. It's not a single leaf left. Not oh, even one leaf. Jeez. And that was protected. Yeah. Because it was in the back. Yeah. It was the area where we were considering putting your tropical garden because it did, it got the most Except protection. It was, it was on the north side of the house, right? Oh, and the winds were blowing from the yeah, north that east. Is, yeah, that's so they they blew right through there. Dang. On the table. On one of the little coffee tables, there was a, a white uh, mandevilla. Uh-huh. That thing got blown off and halfway down. <laughs> you got to uh, water the plants so they're nice and heavy, John. Uh, I did. <laughs> I did. It's just that strong, huh? Uh, yeah, it was terrible. And 
I still had a lot of roses from the auction. That, uh -huh. You know, it's just not everybody had picked them up, and I hadn't shipped everything. I shipped some of the stuff, but still had a lot to ship, and so and you all can, that blew flat. And, and you can water those the morning of, and then they'll still lose all their leaves that afternoon if it's a hot, dry wind. It's like, man, it's, it's not just the water. It's the, the wind and the heat really yeah. takes care of those for you. Hey, Dana, Dana, uh, let it out. Let out your secret that you have stock in the cool yeah, and the, company. The, Kathy <laughs> wants me to read the ingredients. I, I'm afraid to. I, yeah. I, I I know what I'm getting myself into. <laughs> That's so funny. I was so tired Saturday or Thursday after we ate. I mean, it really hit me this year. But really? I think the Santa Anas have something to do with that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I know my wife and Jesse, you know, we, we were watching, uh, I think, trying to uh, – Jesse had not seen any of the wheel at time, so we were going to catch up. Well, 10 minutes in, he was asleep. Shannon was asleep. <laughs> I watched the whole thing for the second time Oh wow. before I realized they were asleep. That's funny. Carla says, the worst win I can remember in Huntington Beach. Really? Yep. The worst that she can bad. remember in Huntington yeah, that, Beach. Yeah, it was huh? bad. It was bad. Dang. Now, when there's Santa Ana's, if you're right on the coast, you're usually not affected, are you? I, other than the temperature going up. I, I mean, say you love it. <laughs> because it's yeah. it's you know seventy nine degrees on the beach in November. Yeah. <laughs> usually that's the thing. But is it really windy or no? Not usually. Yeah. So yeah, I mean yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, usually it's not very windy, windy, um, on the coast um, during a Santa Ana winds because by the time it gets to the coast, right. it's already gone through all the canyons and valleys mm -hmm. and all of that fun stuff. It's weird the wind because during a during wind event. You know, you'll be somewhere in this one area will just get completely damaged, trees blown over, right. and then next to it, it's perfectly fine. Exactly. It's like a tornado going it through a the so city weird. or town, right? Yeah. Hey, this house is still standing. Everything around it's, you know. Yeah. Well, I know north of Fallbrook, uh, when you get out towards, um, uh, you know, more into Riverside County, they get a lot of wind through there, mm -hmm. and there's yeah. tumbleweeds blowing everywhere. <laughs> it's Rolling like the old west. Weeds. <laughs> the Old West. Hey, we've got the quote of the week, which we want to get to. Following that, Tiger, today's guest is who and what again? What are we going to be talking about? Well, we're going to be talking about... If I about had no idea, if I wasn't trying, doing the show. We're going to be talking about if you were looking to landscape or re-landscape your yard, but you're trying to think of something that's going to be beneficial to the environment, starting with the soil and then growing plants from there. We've got Justin, the CEO of Thrive Lot. Um, they're here. They're an online resource to help you start that process. Beautiful. You ready? This is the quote of the week from John Bagnasco. Actually, it's not your quote. You, you're delivering it. Right. It's actually from Beverly Nichols, one of your favorite authors. Now, for those that are new to the show, Beverly is a guy. Beverly's a guy, Is right. a guy. Uh, and he said, a garden knows how gay and delightful it can be, even in the very frozen heart of the winter, if you only give it a chance. Now, let's talk about... Books. You got some favorite Beverly Nichols books, don't you? Uh, Beverly Nichols wrote probably 40 books. And I think about uh, somewhere around six were gardening books. And really, really good. If you're interested in, they're the kind of books where if you're reading, you'll just start laughing out loud because it's that dry British humor. Mm. Really, really good. Let's also point out the uh, chestnuts. On the, oh. new, on the newsletter. Yeah. Notice That's that. John's favorite holiday. We talked about chestnuts a yeah. week or so ago. Right. And I, I, and I started thinking. Of, I even ordered a chestnut cutter on Amazon, <laughs> <laughs> which puts an X in the chestnut. You have to cut open the skin of the chestnut before you, you uh, broil it or bake it because they'll explode, they'll explode otherwise. Okay. Right. Yeah. Popping. Hey, um, Jimmy says, hey. Chestnut's a glass of wine. Jimmy says, hey, guys, John, the big game is almost on. What's the Michigan, big game? Michigan State. I don't know. Is, that what, is that what you're referring to, uh, Jimmy? Michigan, Michigan State? Are they going to play today? Could be. I, I don't know. I went to both those schools. Yeah. That's probably what it is because of John's background. Right. got to be. Right. I got my degree from Michigan well, State after I had flunked out of Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> you flunked chemistry, right? I was originally majoring in chemistry at uh, University of Michigan. That's true. One of one of many of John's failures. No. One of many of John's <laughs> failures. 
<laughs> That's one thing about getting old is you've got more failures than everyone else. Yeah, <laughs> true. I mean, All right. Uh, the old look clock. at Trump. How many failures has he had? Is a businessman, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. And he a lot of people bankrupt yeah. several times, and yeah. still one of the most successful Walt Disney, people out there. Steve Jobs. Yeah. All of them. Uh, you know who else was uh, Colonel Sanders? He yeah. didn't make it big in KFC till his, I think, seventies. Really? Yeah. Okay. The clock says that we have Jeff to take Bezos a break. Jeff didn't have any problems. <laughs> Jeff's Except doing quite well. We're going to take a break, bring our guest on to get your questions, comments ready. Uh, those on BizTalk Radio, thank you for tuning in, Facebook Live. It is Garden America, our special weekend after Thanksgiving 2021 edition here. Brian Maine, John Bagnasker, Tiger Pella Fox, coming right back after this break on BizTalk Radio. Stay with us. We are back from the break, and we appreciate you tuning in here. Along with uh, Tiger Palafox, uh, John Bagnesco, I'm Brian Maine. Welcome, one and all. Thank you for tuning in. Those on Facebook Live, questions, comments? So, uh, yes, we encourage both of those as I now turn the, not the entire program, but this segment over to Tiger Palafox. Yeah, they'll never let me have the entire program, but little bits here and there, right, Brian? We could Absolutely. Vote on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, this morning we have Justin West, the CEO of ThriveLot. Um, ThriveLot.com is an online platform transforming yards into beautiful, bountiful ecosystems. Um, basically, they try to connect people that are looking to improve their yard, but more than just the plants, Justin, right? We're talking the soil, the ecosystem, the plants, everything goes into this. That, that's right, Tiger. It's all connected. The people, too. You know, the yeah. people have to be connected. We're part of it. So, um, Justin, tell us a little bit about your background first, because, you know, you, you, you took a few different turns and twists to get to where you are today. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of weird looking back. Um, when I was a kid, my family kind of strangely moved us out into the middle of nowhere, uh, kind of an an in-between transition for my parents. We ended up in Middle Tennessee on the Cumberland Plateau, 35 miles from the nearest Walmart on a formerly Amish farm. And um, the the formerly Amish folks that had built the house and this barn out of the timber they cut off of the property had also installed a big orchard. And they had this huge, just super productive grapevine. And these big blueberry bushes, and there was an acre of uh, wild blackberry and blueberry bushes, and there was about an acre uh, vegetable garden as well that, that we did. Uh, we kept going in the sort of traditional till and um, <laughs> plant in rows and uh, by the sweat of your brow kind of process. And uh, I, I, you know, my memory of that is that I loved foraging for blackberries. I loved the orchard and canning and preserving and, and all of those things. And I really hated the intense labor of <laughs> the garden. <laughs> and uh, well, fast forward a few years and um, uh, we, we moved again. I ended up in another rural part of Tennessee and, and got involved in 4-H wildlife judging, which is basically you, you learn a lot about uh, local native wildlife species and what types of environments they need and then you look at a piece of land and we looked at everything from a tenth of an acre urban property all the way up to three thousand plus acre watersheds and, and massive farms and you would get the data on the wildlife and then you would make um, sort of ecological 
uh, management changes. You know, we're gonna we're gonna build some brush piles. We're gonna install some food plots. We're gonna change. You know, we're gonna change this part of the forest over to kind of an earlier succession stage. And uh, ended up competing and and um, actually winning the urban ecological design um, in the national championship when I was 15, um, which was which was pretty cool. And then wow. kind of forgot about that for a decade. Um, got into entrepreneurship. Uh, in in college, even before college, really in in high school, um, started e-commerce companies and marketing agencies, and um, got really obsessed with startups and building systems. And I was I was looking for something that could be wholly beneficial, something that I could work on, that I could really put my life and my energy into. And um, right about that time, uh, permaculture kind of hit me in the face as, oh, look, systems design (laughs) applied to nature. It's this design science of working with soil and putting the right plant in the right place so that they take care of each other. So it reduces the amount of work necessary to obtain a yield. And uh, there could be these forestry, agroforestry systems and agroecological systems that decrease in the need for inputs over time while increasing in the outputs. And I just said, wow, why, why isn't this everywhere? Um, how can we make this everywhere? And um, the past six years have been an obsession with uh, finding the answers to those questions. Yeah, and I mean, you know, that's your guys' goal right there is connecting people with these professionals, with these experts um, yeah. in that industry, because that is the hard thing is, you know, it's a, it's a concept, it's an idea about trying to take care of your yard, but in a uh, ecologically sound, um, maybe an easier way for you, because, you know, if you, if it all works together, you have less pests, you have less disease, you have less of a need for water, fertilizers, all that stuff. But then, you know, if you're in San Diego, who, who do you reach out to? You don't know even what to probably Google, right? (laughs) Justin, and you know, that's where Thrive Lot comes in. Yeah, yeah, and, that, and that's and that's what we found is that there's there are people everywhere that say, look, I I, I want to do something environmentally beneficial in my yard. Maybe I even want to experience blueberries and mint tea and <laughs> herbs yeah. and and fresh fruit, fresh vegetables. Um, but I don't have the time to do it. I don't have the knowledge to do it. And so people are kind of looking for those benefits. And so we help we have to sort of. Uh, pull that vision out of them of what they want. And then we find the professionals who, you know, we call agroecologists. They they understand the system relationships between different plants, between soil, between water on a property, and how to set things up so that they can grow as sustainably as possible. And, um, you know, the, the, the challenge that most of those folks have is that even though there is all of this demand from people who want the benefits, um, the people, they're, they're not being found, they're not connecting. So mm-hmm. there are professional permaculture designers, agroecologists everywhere that, you know, some, sometimes they may have found their way into working for like a, a regenerative local farm or into like an arboretum or they're doing some sort of nonprofit thing on the side while they're working, you know, a full-time or, or part-time job in something else, but they're, it's it's like there's this industry that wants to be born that is is struggling to connect and then you know you've you've got the landscaping industry that is huge and mm-hmm. prolific but it's really geared towards um grass and sort of you know ornamental shrubs and um and and using a lot of chemicals and using a lot of labor intensive practices that do create long-term recurring revenue that you know you can you can easily make a small business on but um really have some horrible downsides for the planet and um uh and so so we're kind of this middle ground where we're connecting the people that have the knowledge to the people that want the benefits with the people who have sort of the tools and the and the teams and the uh the skills to execute on larger projects in the landscaping industry to start to transition yards away from these sort of sterile, flat, uh, chemically dependent, water-hungry spaces to lush, bountiful, uh, ecological spaces that support bees and birds and, and even people. 
Yeah, and you know, there's some great examples of what you guys are working on your website, and that's thrivelot.com. You guys also have a Instagram and Facebook feed if people want to look at more pictures. And we're going to have to take a quick break, Justin, but when we get back, um, these aren't just random people you guys suggest to connect. You actually do some vetting of these professionals. When we get back, we'll continue talking with Justin West with ThriveLot. You betcha. Those on the BizTalk Radio, we've got some great sponsors coming your way. Facebook Live, it's going to be a quicker break. But again, speaking of Facebook Live, questions, comments for one of us or Justin right there on our Facebook page as we can just chat away together here on this uh, Saturday morning or whenever you're listening to us here on Garden America. It is break time. We're coming back. I'm Brian Main, John Begnasker, Tiger Palafox. Thank you for tuning in each and every week here on Garden America. All right, guys, as they say, we've got uh, hot mics. We are hot. Coming at you hot and strong here on uh, Saturday morning. Uh, That's when the live show is. Perhaps you're watching on our YouTube channel or maybe a a Facebook page, uh, one of our old shows as well, as we archive just about everything. Don't forget to visit our page as well. Our website is, uh, as John likes to say, www.gardenamerica.com, Tiger. And this morning we're talking with Justin West with ThriveLot.com. And before the break, Justin was just describing what ThriveLot does, and that's connecting people that are looking to enhance their their landscapes, but in a ecologically sound way. And some of the hardest uh, or one of the biggest challenges that people have when they're trying to do this out there for their own is seeing who's out there near them that can help them with this process. Because, you know, Justin, we're talking about people that could be in California and, you know, Missouri and Florida, New York. Um, you know, in I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be able to tell you what you should plant in New York. I, I like to think of myself as a garden expert. It better be um, in the top of a roof someplace. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I just don't know what grows or what would be the uh, best ecological thing to do there where they've, that's where you connect professionals. They've got a concrete jungle. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, yeah, the, the, the exact opposite of what Justin is trying to create there yeah. is, is thriving in New York. But, but, Justin, you guys vet these professionals in a lot of different ways, right? Yeah, that, that's right. And, you know, I, I love that you called out the need for local knowledge. Um, I mean, <laughs> even, even from one hillside to another, there's this concept in ecology called fitness landscape. And if you can imagine sort of like a topographical heat map of as the sunlight angle changes, you know, the northern slope of a hill is different than the southern slope of a hill. A species that does great in one latitude might really struggle in another latitude if it's not placed just perfectly where it likes to be. And so we start with the local experts that understand what we call agroecology. And those folks usually go by a different name. They usually go by either permaculture designers or some sort of regenerative urban farmer or, or some sort of ecological site designer, that sort of thing. There's a few different certification education paths, that sort of thing. But certification really isn't, um, you know, isn't, uh, isn't really experience. And so we do look for experience. Um, this has come from a lot of great mentorship from folks who've been active agroecologists installing and taking care of even huge systems for 20, 30 years. They'll all tell you that uh, nature is not more complex than you think. It's more complex than you can think. <laughs> so the only way to really know, to really understand working with plants and soil in your place is to have done that. And so we look for um, folks who can point to projects that they have both designed, installed, and kept alive for at least three years. And that being sort of the crucial point where they've seen several seasons, where they've seen several iterations, and they're starting to become uh, in tune with nature. And one of the things that we're working towards, um, and it's just getting started, is we actually have a forum, a private forum for these agroecologists, so that uh, the more experienced folks can connect with the less experienced folks, so that design and project decisions and questions that come up can be posted, people can contribute their knowledge on it, that sort of thing. Um, So so on the the agroecological front, we we look for folks that are, that are going to bias towards no-till. We look for folks that are going to bias towards native species. Um, you know, invasives are here. Some of them are useful. 
Uh, we kind of have to work with them in some situations. But, um, and, and we look for folks who can really tell us their strategies for developing soil and keeping water on a property. Those are, those are really the pillars of, of um, the agroecological strategy. And, and the neat thing about the, this concept, this idea, Justin, is that, you know, it doesn't, it, it's, it doesn't have to be necessarily um, kind of all or nothing for people. I mean, like you said, you know, with the um, judging that you did with your 4-H was, you know, people could be on a small lot. They can be on a big lot. You know, they can dedicate a quarter of their property to this. They can dedicate all their property to this. Um but it's a great way to make a difference no matter what you do. I mean, as an example, you know, our, our, our co-host here, Justin John, lives in a community called Fallbrook. And they have large parcels of land where they live. These are people that live, you know, on, um, you know, mountains and hillsides and canyons. Um, and they're not going to always utilize the full extent of their, their landscape, their property. But there are areas where they might leave it natural. But how do you enhance those natural areas, right? How do you create better mm. fire suppression? How do you create better and... Uh, ecosystem for the animals and plants that you live there, you can help them do do that as well, right? Uh, absolutely. We've done some really cool projects with folks who have, you know, a few acres to spare. Um, and and one one in particular jumps out. That was that was not too long ago where um, this guy in Ohio had a uh, forested area and it was just becoming overrun by invasive honeysuckle. Mm. And uh, so we we brought a team out there, actually uh, ripped out all the honeysuckle, um, shredded it into beautiful mulch paths that eventually will turn into growing medium <laughs> <laughs> that eventually will turn into uh, new plants and, and an understory. And, and uh, man, it's it's really nice if you do have some some extra space that you don't want to use um you can pull mushroom logs out of there. You can you can have your you know you can have extra leaves and extra tree fall for mulch on your property, that sort of thing. Yeah, and you know one of the things that I see on your social media too that I like a lot is you know just that concept of being able to walk through a yard and then just picking things as as you kind of <laughs> meander through you know whether it's the berries or fruit or you know different trees and that's such a neat concept. You know you don't have to plant an orchard you don't have to put them all in rows you can put them throughout the landscape right absolutely and this is one of the reasons why you know our our projects right now we're we're a small company at this stage and we have to focus on large projects to be able to feed ourselves now as we grow as we build out our supply networks as our actual software platform gets more robust and makes it easier for people to connect and get to work, we do intend to be able to do smaller and smaller projects, even down to, you know, if you just want a tiny little pollinator garden bed popped into your, uh, into your yard, you can just go on thrivelot.com, kind of click button, get ecosystem, right? Uh, but where we're at right now is, is where we are doing these more complete uh, landscape flips, if you will, landscape uh, projects that, that tend to be larger. And so one of the things that we do is we start with the local ecologists who comes out to the property, looks at the property, and this is this is really the coolest experience I think that people have right off the bat with Drive Lot is the ecologist comes out to your property and spends about an hour walking around with you. And I've been on a bunch of these, and it is always so wild to see people who are tuned into nature walking a property and going, Oh, look at this, you know, this little weed that's growing over here. Well, that means such and such has gotten into the soil. And, oh, you can tell right here that there's, you know, there's some <laughs> sort of uh, difference in the, in the substrate of the subsoil where there's water actually pooling underground here. And, oh, well, this, you know, this is a such and such shrub and tree, and it's incredibly old. <laughs> you get this kind of ecological survey, which, which helps take your vision and sort of spatially structure that out. It, because you might be thinking, oh, I love blueberries. I have my door outside the kitchen that goes right into the backyard. I want my blueberries there. But when an ecologist looks at that spot, they might say, well, you don't have enough sunlight. And even if we could work with that, the soil that's there is going to take so much amending, it would actually be better to put it over on the east side of the house, uphill, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. And so um, we start with this sort of ecological structure, but then we bring in a landscape architect. And landscape architects um, that we work with are very creative people. They love working with colors and textures. 
love creating uh, what we call experiential rooms in a property where you can have this kind of, you know, these lush space, spaces that sort of segment themselves. So you can go outside and you can go from one experience to another. And what we really want is for people to be able to be immersed in their ecosystem and to love spending time in it, to love having other people come over and experience that and want it themselves. And yeah, also be able to, uh, you know, grab a grab a big mixing bowl, go outside and pick an awesome stir fry. <laughs> yeah, right. That'd be so cool. And um, we are going to have to take another break here in one minute, Justin. Um, but part of part of the whole ecosystem that you just described. I mean, we're talking edibles, we're talking native plant species, um, along with those come pests. And part of the plan that you put together for people is the integrated pest management, not just the plants and the soil. And when we get back from break, we'll continue talking with Justin West with ThriveLot.com. That's right. And those on uh, Facebook Live, feel free to jump in with any questions, comments. Uh, those on BizTalk Radio, you want to watch our show live every week, you can tune in. Uh, just go to our Facebook page. That is Garden America Radio Show. And at 8.06 uh, West Coast time, we kick things off, Eastern Time Zone, 11.06. As Tiger mentioned, break coming up. One more segment, hour number one, if you're tuned in to BizTalk Radio. Back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. Yes, indeed. If you are tuned in on the BizTalk Radio, thank you so much every week for doing that. You've got uh, news coming up top of the hour. We are back at six minutes after. If your local market carries both of our hours, one and two here on Garden America. In the meantime, learning a lot from Justin this morning, Tiger, as we go back and continue our conversation. And again, those on Facebook Live, feel free to chime in if and when the uh, feeling moves you, as we say. <laughs> And uh, before the break, we were chatting with Justin um, about ThriveLot.com and how they integrate the soil, the design, all of that into the plan for your yard. Um, and one of the things that when you have this kind of landscape, Justin, obviously you are attracting birds and butterflies and bees and critters to the yard because it's, again, this whole ecosystem. But with that comes some of the pests. So how do you guys address that issue? Because obviously, you know, as you mentioned in the beginning, you know, Thrive Lot is, is intended not to use chemicals, not intended to use um, interference with the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, the, that's right. And, and it's a great question. It's one that comes up all the time. And so first we've got to start by understanding what we mean by pests. Right? Now, uh, tomato hornworms, you know, that's an easy example. Um, anything that's going to eat the things that I want to eat, right? The pests can also be, and always are, I should say, uh, wildlife as well. I mean, everywhere, you know, the projects we do in South Florida deal with iguana pressure. Uh, <laughs> projects that we do yeah. in New York and, you know, New York suburbs even deal with uh, deer pressure. I mean, believe it or not, the yeah. deer are here everywhere. And uh, rabbits, you know, squirrels um, and, and slugs and you, you name it. So a pest is something that is eating the things that we want to eat. Now, foundationally, whenever we start with designing the ecosystem and when we really start with the agroecological skill set, the, the first weapon, <laughs> and I, I don't even really love using that term, but the foundation that sets us up for success uh, against pests is biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And what happens in nature, you know, if you, if you go out in the Amazon rainforest and if you know what you're looking for, you can find food everywhere, and you're definitely going to find beauty, and you're definitely going to see biodiversity. And there are no pests. Now, there might be things that bother you, but you're not going to you – know, nobody's out in the Amazon rainforest um, spraying for, <laughs> for, for pests. <laughs> for aphids and yeah. worms. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. No, no, nobody's out there having to work, having to smash all these potato bugs, you know, having to deal with this thing. And so what, what actually made pests? Um, whenever we think of kind of pestilence and, and this kind of biblical concept uh, was at the start of agriculture when people said, okay, well, look, we can, we can grow this grain and we can turn this grain into bread that's storable, that's transportable, that's sellable, that, that people can live on. Um, let's figure out how to turn this ecosystem, you know, whatever the land was, into this single thing that we know that we can grow turn into food and sell. And so they clear out the ecosystem, they kind of scrape it off, 
and we put in this one thing that we want to eat. Now, the way Mother Nature works is that there are niches and there's diversity and there is extreme competition. You know, nature is intense (laughs) and always buzzing with life. And so in every niche, there's, you know, there are things that eat different things and there are things that eat them. And in a biodiverse system that's full of little nooks and crannies and corners and different types of food, there's really small niches that whatever eats in that and whatever thrives in that spot can thrive and it will thrive and reproduce and try to fill that niche as quickly as possible to survive. But right around the corner is something that eats it. And also right around the corner are things that it doesn't eat. And so there's balance and there's limits and nothing ever really gets out of control. But when we go in and we scrape off the ecosystem, scrape out the biodiversity, and we put in one single thing or even just a few things that we want to eat, well, something eats that. And that thing will start to eat and will start to reproduce as quickly as possible to survive and to spread out and to fill the niche. The problem is that the niche is huge, whether it's, uh, you know, it's a, uh, a garden bed outside the house with tomatoes in it or a 10,000 acre wheat field. Um, that is a huge chunk of food for one thing. Now, what we do is we use biodiversity. Uh, we set up uh, typically, I mean, <laughs> Our average project has between 50 to over 100 different species, and I'm talking on a quarter-acre lot. (laughs) So there are all kinds of plants all next to each other. And, yeah, we do planter boxes with tomatoes. And, yeah, there's a chance there's going to be hornworms on those. But in our projects, usually right next to the tomatoes, there is a plethora of native wildflowers growing and attracting all kinds of bacchanoid wasps the things that come in and kill and eat while their larvae eat those hornworms. And so by setting up a really diverse ecosystem full of different niches, full of different foods, full of different habitats, um, we can mimic the balance that nature creates naturally. And we can still grow things that we want, just instead of growing a whole bunch of one thing, um, we grow a, a little bit of a bunch of different things. And the other side of that then on the wildlife piece, you know, wildlife in this country and in, in the world are typically kind of starving. They're, they're looking for food. And this was something I learned way back in 4-H. Um, if, you've got, if you've got wildlife attacking your garden, one, you do have to create some kind of barrier. We have to fence it. We have to put up some sort of hedge maybe that diverts them along their usual path. But put some food for them outside of that barrier on the outside of that path where they can eat and maybe even something that pulls them to a different part of the property um, somewhere that you don't mind for them to be. And um, those, those tactics tend to be very effective against pests. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense, you know, to, to, you know, make it work and not just try to be a big shield out there and defense of ev- against everything, but like, you know, just make it all kind of work together. And I think that's, the basis behind creating a, a landscape that is going to be easier for you because, you know, I mean, it, it you're, you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself if you're out there trying to battle against all of these creatures, all these pests at once. And, you know, you're going to walk away feeling defeated. But if, if you go into the landscape and you kind of are willing to give and take in some of these areas, I think you'll be more successful down the road. Hey, that's, um, that's right. Justin, and I don't, oh, want, I don't want to imply that nature is not more complex than you can think and that there won't be problems. Yeah, <laughs> Again, no. local, local agroecologists, when there are issues, would come out, assess the situation, tweak things, maybe have to rip some things out, you know, maybe use some sort of a organic compound like a neem oil if, if we have to, uh, depending on the situation. But, um, yeah, yeah there's, you gotta be, you've got to be flexible to work with nature and, and try to create redundancy. Hey, all right. So, Justin, we got to take another quick break. When we get back, I want to have you be able to walk us through a little bit. When somebody goes to thrivelot.com, what can they expect to happen and um, uh, expect to the process to be? And those I also on- have a few questions. Oh, perfect. I also have a few questions from listeners for Justin. Okay, very good. So uh, keep that in mind and uh, stay with us, obviously. Those on BizTalk Radio, this is the final segment of hour number one. You've got news coming up top of the hour in just a few moments. We come back at six minutes after. Facebook Live going to be a much quicker turnaround, so do stay where this is. John mentioned questions. More of Justin, uh, myself, Brian Main, Tiger Palafox here on Garden America.
All righty. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, those on BizTalk Radio, hour number two of uh, Garden America, Facebook Live. It's all one long big show here. One long big show. <laughs> you're, it's you're been one of those mornings of today. Huh? All these words coming in, not necessarily in the order right. they should be in. <laughs> but I do know the next order of business as we continue with Justin, and John mentioned some questions, so let's uh, keep on rolling. Yeah, John, do you have the questions in front of you? Well, we, uh, we were talking earlier about honeysuckle, and uh, Dell says that he also has wild honeysuckle that's thriving and wants to know. Uh, some practical methods of control. I know that Justin <laughs> mentioned going through and pulling it all out. <laughs> I think Dell wants uh, an easier way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, whew. Unfortunately, I don't. I don't know an easier way. If I did, <laughs> did I'd, I'd let you know. Um, you know, honeysuckle. I I I love the smell of it. Um, feeds some pollinators. But um, it, it can certainly choke out a lot of native undergrowth and, and take over forests in, in a lot of the United States. And um, the best way that I know of, of dealing with it is, is to go out with, um, with, with axes and picks and, and uh, you know, kind of rip it out by the root and, and put, it through a, uh, put it through a shredder. Now, it, when, it's, when it's shredded and, and piled up and... Uh, uh, it gets a little little bit of heat and time to compost. It does make an excellent mulch, uh, but the, the labor-intensive process um, is the only one that I know without using some sort of harsh and, and toxic chemical. Yeah, right. pick is probably important because you do need to get the roots out. Otherwise, it's just going to come back. That's right. And we have another question from uh, Rick in Star, Idaho, and he wants to know how important trees are to your plan. Uh, trees are critical. Trees are everything. Um, there's, there's at least, depending on your philosophy, there's at least seven layers to a, a forest garden, and, and the forest garden is, is really the ultimate biodiverse ecosystem. And it starts with a canopy layer. Um, you know, just having a big canopy layer like a, like a walnut, or a walnut's actually not a good example because they're because uh, the compounds they produce, but a big canopy layer like an oak or, or something like that um, can create totally different microclimates, create totally different habitats for the other plants around and can extend growing seasons, can mulch other plants. Um, and it's, it's really critical to have big trees if you have the space for it. And then, of course, you can you put the subcanopy trees around that. That's the next layer. So our smaller trees, um, uh, fruit trees, um, those types of things. Uh, vining layers are critical and, and need trees to grow up. So you know, they're edible and, and beneficial vining plants like muscadine and hardy kiwi that will uh, grow up on, on trees and, and need trees or some sort of trellis to be able to grow. Um, tree, trees are critical. And, and you know, you can, Big nitrogen fixing trees. Um, I mean, one of my favorite trees is a mulberry tree. A mulberry tree can grow 100 feet tall, live over 300 years, and produces 600 pounds of fruit a year. And you don't have to do anything to it. <laughs> it's really an amazing machine. So, in the projects that we put in, we're again, you know, we're putting 50 to 100 different species on average. Um, our average project gets about 30 trees, mostly smaller fruit trees. Um, mostly because we're dealing with smaller urban and suburban properties. Perfect. Um, and I'm looking through right now, and um, I don't... You're seeing Carla right there, John. Right, we just got, just got oh. Carla in Huntington Beach, wants to know how you control rats, mice, and possums with your concept. They're mm. eating all the lettuce, the seedlings, digging up the soil, even in her pots. And she's got a small lot, so she grows a lot in pots and covers them with other pots every other night. But the, even this doesn't always work. Yeah, again, what you're what you're dealing with is is uh, starving starving wildlife. And uh, you know, I've, I've recently learned some cool things about possums. Possums, I've you know always kind of wondered. I don't know, they're always a little uh, seem a little nasty, but um, possums are great. They actually, believe it or not, they eat ticks. They eat cockroaches. Um, they eat a lot of nasty bugs that we don't want. Um, well, that's why they're so cranky. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But uh, man, what a what a good yeah. good thing to have around. Now, 
if you're on a small property and and growing in pots, you know, and there's there's things coming to eat out of those pots, those those things are hungry. And with a small property, it's much harder to establish food for uh, for those things that are hungry. Now, if you if you could set up, you know, if you can find out where the wildlife is coming from and what its kind of traffic patterns are, you might find uh, some way you might find where it's living, and and you know maybe that's a wild space, a median or a park or something like that, and you might plant some things that that um, the possum would would eat out there. Now, now for the for the rats and mice around a home in a in a residential setting, you know they're they're adapted to living off of humans and. Your best bet is just going to be to get a cat, most likely. <laughs> as yep. much as I hate to say that, as an ecologist, I, uh, you know, cats uh, destroy a billion birds a year, feral cats. But um, they do have a purpose if you're trying to grow food and um, and dealing with uh, with small rodents. Yeah, unfortunately, Carla, the the source of your problems probably your attic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and or uh, likely your neighbor's attic. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so this is a, this is another thing in dealing with with wildlife pressure. It's really critical not to just focus on our own properties, but to look at our communities mm-hmm. and and to try to set up um, environments and try to you know make alliances with your neighbors to uh, to uh, figure out how to create a, a more abundant ecosystem around you and. And, uh, and and hopefully divert the wildlife pressure to a, a more natural setting for them. Yeah, perfect. Good tips. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, uh, we just have a little bit of time left, but I wanted to um, have you walk through somebody's interested in your guys' program. Um, they go to thrivelot.com. There is a, um, a, a portion of the website to put your information in and what you're looking to do. Give us a little rundown of what they – can expect to happen from Thrive Lot. Yeah, so we want to make the uh, the process as simple and easy as possible. Um, so it's a <laughs> complex process, but we're making it simple and easy. You just start with that Start My Project button on ThriveLot.com. Answer the questions, fill in a bunch of information that will help us uh, talk through on a quick call after that um, to be able to really understand your vision and to be able to understand your property and your needs, um, your timing, that that sort of thing. And after you're, you've gone through the online forum and you've talked to one of our project success managers, um, then we will match you with a local ecologist if we have one. If we don't have one in your area yet, we kind of need some time to build a list up uh, to be able to focus on that area because, again, we are still pretty new. We're not everywhere, but we are going everywhere. Um, and after we've matched you with an ecologist, then we will schedule the time for that ecologist to come out. They'll spend about an hour with you walking your property and taking your vision and kind of structuring it out into uh, where where the right things need to go, what's the best sort of structural setup for the different features that you've wanted, you know, where's the best angle for the greenhouse, uh, where's the best place to put your composting, biodigester, those types of things, where the, where are the blueberries going to live. And then after that process, uh, the ecologist will work with our team on our platform and a landscape architect to come up with um, basically how much time and cost and effort it's going to be to really plan the whole project out and to do a detailed um, landscape design. And so then you'll get a quote for that and an understanding of the next steps on your project. And uh, then that kicks off the design and planning process, which turns out um, multiple iterations of an actual landscape design, exactly where each plant is going to go, exactly what structures and paths and things we're, we're going to build on the property, all with your input, so all a back and forth process. But then also sourcing the contractors to actually do the construction and getting their quotes for each line item of what needs to be built in that plan. And then that gives you the, the full picture, the full understanding of the project. And from that, we go into installation. Um, very often, our installation has to span uh, both a kind of spring and fall season, depending on where you are, uh, can be a lot better to plant trees and shrubs in the fall and, and annual vegetables in the spring. Hey, hey um, Justin, so- sorry sorry to interrupt. Uh, we do have to take another quick break. Yep. Sorry. When we get back, we'll finish yep. uh, chatting with Justin West with ThriveLot.com. We'll come back and wrap it up, so do stay with us here on Garden America. And again, after uh, Justin, uh, of course, we're still going to be here. So more questions, comments, uh, anything on your mind Again, on Facebook Live as we chat back and forth. Those on BizTalk Radio, bit longer break. Coming right back here on Facebook Live. Stay with us. (music) 
And we are back. It is, uh, well, Saturday morning as far as we're concerned, maybe Saturday afternoon where you are, or perhaps you're uh, listening or watching to a previously archived show. Uh, That said, uh, Tiger, let's get back and wrap things up with Justin as uh, we continue. Yeah, Justin West was just describing the process. If you were to go to thrivelot.com and how they help you um, start and then um, install your wonderful new ecologically sound, biodiverse landscape in Justin, before I had cut you off, you were you were kind of at the point where now you were going to be pairing people with, I think, installers in their area because you already connected them to the professional ecologist. That, that's right, yeah. And then, and then installation might go through a couple of seasons depending on the, the project and the needs. But once that's done and, and actually through that process, we'll come up with a stewardship plan that typically meets people where they are. And, and stewardship means maintenance, can mean coaching, it can mean continued development of your property. It can mean replanting those annual vegetable beds, that sort of thing. And um, a lot of our customers, you know, they just want, hey, come out and do everything for me. Check it out regularly. Um, replant things as needed. I just want to be harvesting. Um, and then other customers want to actually do some of the work themselves um, and want to actually be involved and want some more, something closer to a coaching plan. And so we put together an annual plan. And um hope to uh hope to work with every customer for life yeah i mean i think that's a great way to to look at the way you guys do things because you know some people love this concept but maybe don't have the time or ability to kind of take it on on their own and i think that's where some of these projects fail down the road but if you provide them with the help and the back um support there then they will be successful down the road justin thank you very much for joining us this weekend lots of great information um, again, thrivelot.com is the website. Um, you know, good luck. Keep us in, in, in keep us in, um, keep, keep us in, in touch, mind. keep in touch, keep in touch with how things are going, um, for you and, uh, the areas that you're expanding to, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. It's been a blast and I really appreciate what you're doing. Love the show. All right. Thank you, you Justin. Care. I think you caught what I have this morning. <laughs> I did. The, the words are coming, but not necessarily in the same order that you'd like them to come out. Correct. But we get it. We get it. Hey, so he's like uh, like an interior decorator. You can hire him just to, to do it all, Yeah. to get ideas, only this would be outside. And li- I like the fact that, uh, obviously. <laughs> that would be an exterior decorator. What did Brian? I say? Yeah, he's an exterior. A, exactly. Yeah. He's an exterior decorator right. doing what might be similar to an interior there you go. decorator. But... I like the fact that, that he takes into consideration regional problems. Yeah. It's not just a cross the country template. Well, and I think that's where, you know, this concept has failed um, so many times in our, in our industry is this kind of wild garden. Um, you know, people love to install it. It's easy to install. I don't want to say easy. It's, it's, it's easy to start and install, but then people have a problem down the road with the maintenance, we'll talk maintaining with the, it, with with the upkeep of it and stuff. And it's not that it's difficult; it's just it is different than what he described so, as far so as the standard were, lawn landscape. If, if you were to come up with my maintain a wild garden, it's going to look like a wild yeah, garden. Yeah. So, so that if you or somebody were to come over, a landscape architect or somebody, and set me up, you've done all the work and everything, but I wasn't really involved. Yeah. When things start to happen, I'm not going to know how to maintain it. Right. I'm going to say, hey. What about this or that? And you'd say, well, remember, I said don't water this time of the year. <laughs> yeah. Heavy watering this time of the year. Don't cut back then, but cut, cut. you still have to do it. Yep. That's Definitely. why you should have got the A plan where we do it all for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and then uh, and we'll, we'll come by seasonally and uh, do what needs to be done. Do you remember when we were in uh, England, mm-hmm. meadows yep. were a big thing for a you. while? I think Christopher Lloyd was – pushing those for a while over at Great Dixter. And, yep. And they had I a got, huge one. Remember that in the back? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they really look weedy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and like you say, you know. A you, wild garden. Everybody yeah. has in the back of their mind this picture of running through a meadow no. and then laying in it. No. <laughs> it's, it's not something you really want to do. Yeah. I remember at Great Dixter, I mean, there's just beautiful landscapes all around it. And then I turned this corner and – it was right next to their shop. Do you remember the shop in the back? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It was right Gift next shop, to it. right? Yeah. Yeah. And I was, just, I just looked. I'm like, oh, is this the area they haven't gotten to yet? <laughs> and then there's a big sign on it, like Meadow Garden. And I was like, 
This seems like the area that they just haven't worked on yet. It, it needs some attention. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they have plans for it in the future. L lying down in a meadow, oh. you say, is not not what you think it uh, might be. It's no. not the fantasy that that would necessarily come true. No, there's all kinds of critters and itchy. You might get itchy. Itchy, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but um, but nonetheless, they do have a purpose, and you know, meadows are important to our environment, our ecosystem. I just don't want one in my yard. So I hear more of a take a long walk on the beach guy, not not laying down or frolicking in a meadow. Yeah, no, no frolicking in a meadow. But I'll, I'll walk through a forest or, you know, hike a trail or walk down a beach. But, yeah, meadows, not so much. Yeah. Would you trust John to be your leader in the wilderness? John? Yeah. Hmm. Are you a survivalist? Can you survive out there? I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. think I'd have a chance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot more to it than meets the eye. Right. You know, but people that know what they're doing look around and say, you can eat those, don't eat those. Um, if, if it has three leaves on them, stay away from it. I mean, they know all of that. I think right. I would rely on tiger if I had to be out in the wilderness. <laughs> well, that, that's yeah. your warmth is taking care of now. What about the, re what about the rest <laughs> Everything of Everything else. <laughs> no, but, um, you know, it is, it is neat to kind of see – nature in your own property right because you know as justin was just describing being able to walk through some area with somebody who knows about the the native landscape and say oh right. you, well you have this and you have that already and you you just walk by them every day and you don't even notice or difference um, in soil yeah from yeah. from from like one one area 100 yards to the left right back or front it's going to be different yeah and i mean john got me hooked on to this facebook group i think it's rare plants Rare plants? Is that the one you got me hooked on to? Yeah. Yeah, rare plants. I think it's all it is, Facebook group. and Things you've never heard of. Well, it's these people, and they're out wherever they live right. in nature in very unique plants, very um, very uh, unique flowers, um, you know, not not prolific plants that are, aren't are covering hillsides. But they're taking pictures of these plants, and they're in cracks of rocks, or they're, they're in a forest, and they're just tucked away. And I'm like, wow, if you weren't looking – you would walk right by it. And these are these are plants every day in our area. Because you don't know what to look for. You don't know what to look That's for. Exactly. exactly. Well, you know, in nature, things can change quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on, on what's going on. And in uh, this week's newsletter, mm -hmm. right? Very and fine newsletter. A lot of information on chestnuts. <laughs> but the American chestnut, when my grandmother was alive, there were over 3 billion chestnut trees in the united states how many bill, bill? three billion that was a really bee. i wanted to make sure that was a Jeez. bee yeah and as a matter of fact at one time like in the appalachian mountains they estimated that 40 percent of all the trees were chestnuts whoa and and today and today zero <laughs> Now, there's still... We have to take a break. So, all right, because so I've got a lot to talk about. John's got a lot to talk about, <laughs> and I don't want to have to interrupt him later. So, so we're you want to know about chestnuts. So on the other side, it's going to be John. We're going to be talking about uh, chestnuts, and who knows what else here on Garden America. Looking at our Facebook page, questions, comments, you bet. Back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. We promised to return, and this is what we call the other side of the break. So we are back here on uh, Garden America. Uh, thank you for tuning in, Facebook Live, Biz Talk Radio. We we're talking chestnuts uh, just prior to the break, and uh, John's going to continue with the words of wisdom as he continues to pontificate. I see you're trying to build an open fire over there, but that's not what I'm talking about. Something right different. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the American chestnut uh, was not only. Uh, kind of like what Justin was talking about, it was not only uh, a notable hardwood tree, mm. but it was a food source for millions of animals. Yeah, right. And it was also one of the main sources for passenger pigeons. Mm. And we, we've never seen passenger pigeons. I think the last one, whose name was Martha, died at the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. But passenger pigeon flocks, can you imagine a flock a mile wide and 300 miles long? That's how many passenger pigeons Crazy. there were. They, they estimated that that flock, as it went by, 
would have blot out the sun. about three billion birds in it. Yeah, it would literally blot out the sun. Sure. And um, and this was in the 1900s, right? Like like no, the, you said the 1914 was the last one. Right. This was so, in like the late 1800s. It, right. Yeah. Like the yeah. 1880 so to 1900. That, what are you most concerned with? Well, well, you have to have an umbrella. I, that's exactly. Sure. That's where I was going. Exactly. I don't think an umbrella would even stop that. But can you imagine how, I mean, that would be like a rainstorm coming down at you. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they said that as the flock flew by overhead, it would take about 15 minutes to pass. That's unbelievable. Yeah. But what was one of their main sources of food? Chestnuts. 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 Right. So the ch a lot of people think that, well, you know, uh, hunters, people would, I mean, back then squab was on every, every menu in every restaurant, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, you just get a shotgun and, but we and you've got dinner for it. a week or something. But when the, the chestnut trees died from the chestnut blight, which they think came from Asia, uh, they're not sure. But as the chestnuts died, you're not getting any more food source for all these birds and, and the birds died out. So here's the interesting thing. They're now working with, um, there were a few chestnut trees still alive because they were outside the natural habitat. Um, and there's still about maybe 400 million chestnuts trees alive in eastern forests, but they, they've died to the ground. And what used to be massive 100 foot trees uh, you know, now are little sprouts coming out of the ground no more than maybe an inch thick. So they, they've been trying to uh, introduce chestnut trees that are resistant to the chestnut blight. So you can reintroduce the chestnut tree into American forests. And at the same time, they're trying to resurrect, uh, a la pigeon? Jurassic Park, the passenger pigeon. The passenger pigeon is related to the morning dove, so they have passenger pigeon DNA that they can inject into the morning dove eggs and maybe bring back passenger pigeons. But it's really not any, there's no purpose in doing that if there's okay. no food for them. Right. Where, now, where do we get the name passenger pigeon? What, what's the, the, the background on that? You know, I don't know that, but that's a good research project for you. For me to do that? Yeah, yeah sound like a teacher. I, I like to know that. But, you know, it's funny... You know, you you said this in the beginning, John, that nature is it it moves quickly and changes quickly. And you know, like I was leading to was that you know the the last passenger pigeon passed away in 1914. This you know large population of passenger pigeons was 1880, 1890, started dwindling in the 1900s, and then you know over a span of 30 years, this happened, and that is quick in nature. That's not slow. That's it, very it's quick, fast. But you would have thought that with 30 years' notice, you might well, start to be okay. able to do something about it. No, I mean, I, we're thinking in today's yeah, no, term, Brian. Meaning, mean, like, meaning like, years in the whole you know, I mean, time. back in 1880, to get a letter from the East Coast to the West Coast, it took, you know, a few weeks. You mean like today? <laughs> you know, not like an email or a phone call today. So, so yeah, I mean, they just didn't know what was happening, I think, before it was too late. But, you know, I mean, today that wouldn't happen because, like you're saying, data and information would be mm -hmm. shared immediately. Sure, immediately and we, would, yeah. we would, again, try to, you know, I mean, today there are the same things happening. I mean, in the California forest, there's, you know, there's beetles, there's diseases. I mean, we're talking um, one of the one of the hardiest trees on in Southern California is a canary Canary Island um, palm, palm. Right. Mm -hmm. and they're dying right now because of a, um, a disease that gets into the tree and there's nothing they can do to really stop this. Um, you know, but that Canary Island palm is not necessarily a food source for a lot or anything. So this is not the support, but I can guarantee if that was a citrus, like the citrus psyllid or They'd something. They'd be doing right? something about it. There'd be right. people moving quick on, on stopping that problem. By the way, I misspoke earlier. Carrier pigeon? No, what I had said was that the, the flock would take 14 minutes to fly overhead. It was 14 hours oh my goodness. for that flock to pass. Jeez. Okay, that, that I think people were thinking, wait, 310 miles and 14 you know what the, minutes. Fast birds. Yeah, those are fast birds. That's a little disturbing, 
just that whole now setting you know where the, the birds came from. Fourteen yeah. hours to fly over. Yeah. What a phenomenon to look up and see that. Right. And by the way, you wanted to know the term comes from uh, the French, which is <clears throat> pigeon de passage, which means birds flying overhead. <laughs> <laughs> birds flying overhead. Yeah. Oh. That's true. It was because of the massive migrations, you yeah. know, the, the pigeons that were <clears throat> passing by. So that's where the name passenger pigeon comes from. Yeah. So, so yeah. Nature but you're can right. move 30 quick. years is nothing. Yeah. I mean, in Not terms in of expanding. Not in nature. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, the chestnuts <clears throat> that we have at Christmas time mm -hmm. are, are uh, European <clears throat> chestnuts. Like in the newsletter? Right. Are those European? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, those are European chestnuts and not related. Well, they're related the same genus as American chestnuts, <clears throat> but they are not affected by the chestnut blight. Same thing with... Uh, uh, what's commonly referred to as Chinese chestnuts, mm -hmm. uh, not affected by the, the blight. So you can plant Chinese chestnuts at your home. We had one, a uh, couple trees at our house in Michigan. So chestnuts, by the way, are dioecious, Brian. So I you told have, you, Tiger. You have to have both male and female. <laughs> to have them both. Can't yeah. just have one chestnut tree. So speaking of soil, in, in how by the way, how much property do you own? Is it an acre, two acres? What what is actually your property? Three point five. Now within that three point five area. No chestnut forest. What about is the soil the same or does your soil change? Oh no, he's got all kinds of the different... soil was relatively the same, but when because it was an old avocado grove. Right. But when you build a house, a lot of soil gets moved. But but even so, I mean, you have a um, creek, so you have a river down in that wild you have, area. You have a river. I think kind John of pronounces it as a creek <laughs> area. You know, so you, we call it the tree pit. You know, you've got <laughs> your slope, which has been left 100 percent kind of natural, and then you have where the avocado grove was, and now you have where your house was. So you've got for no, the avocado grove came right up to where the house is. Oh, okay, so it was, and we. We but, took that uh, grade down six feet. Oh yeah, I saw and the pushed rock. it to the slope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's 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 rough right there, but you you know you've got to see what you have left right. with where you're going to plant. And on three and a half acres, there's going to be a lot of different areas for different types. Yeah, plants. there's going to be some variances, which yeah. you know, which Justin talked about that people just think that okay, let's lay out one plan. Within that plan, though, there's diversity. Yeah, I was I was talking to a customer this week about their patio, and you know, on his patio, he was saying, "I can't grow anything because it's a patio. It's got a lot of reflective heat. It's hot, even though it's downtown San Diego, which you know is coastal, so it should stay cool. Right. But it's the heat. The he urban... should visit Brian if he thinks yeah. he can't grow anything on his patio. Well, the urban well. heat. But that's what I was saying. Well, I think that you need to pick some plants that create some protection. Absolutely, so, you know, right. Small tree. privet, you know, privet something really hardy that can soften that heat that can protect the other plants. Because, um, you know, he was describing, oh, well, I put these succulents out. I'm like, yeah, but you know, the the glass on the side of your house is like a mirror that's just scorching them. Um, so it's creating that environment too with what you have, sure. Um, because that'll be successful. I mean, that's what Brian created. His is like a tropical rainforest in there. <laughs> exactly. Okay, we're going to take a break. We have one more segment coming up. And uh, still time for your questions, your comments on Facebook Live. Biz Talk Radio, same thing. One more segment as we continue on your weekend or whenever you're listening to us or watching us here, along with uh, John Bagnasco, I'm Brian Main, Tiger Palafox. One more break, one more segment after these messages on Biz Talk Radio. We made it to the final segment. Yes, indeed, Biz Talk Radio, Facebook Live. And again, as I mentioned just before the break, uh, still time for a few questions or comments as we uh, wrap up our uh, post-Thanksgiving show for the year 2021 here on uh, Facebook Live and Biz Talk Radio, gentlemen. One of our uh, loyal listeners reminded to make sure uh, reminded us to make sure that we wish you a happy Gosh. birthday tomorrow. Yeah. Shh, don't tell him, but yeah. I got him a plant. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think she got you a mango tree. Yeah. <laughs> a condo mango. <laughs> you know what's funny is is because, you know, she she was off work. Dana was off work Wednesday. Uh-huh. So that'll be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, back on Monday. She brought home this pothos oh. in a little pot. She goes, well, I didn't want to leave it there all weekend all by himself. And It was what? Probably pothos. Pothos. Oh, pothos. 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 And, pothos. and um, tomato, tomato, pothos, pothos. Yeah. And I said, well, chances are it would have been okay. Trust me, I've had how many in my studio <laughs> with no light and fluorescent lighting. And she goes, yeah, but it was, it's lonely. I didn't want to be alone. There was an article about that with this whole pandemic where people left their offices and they left some of their plants. And here's a good example. All of a sudden they come back and the pothos is completely trailing the uh, desk and everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, so we have it yeah. right outside our door to be taken back to work on Monday. Now, now Brian's patio, For we were talking about little ecosystems. One, one of the best places that I know of that – has this is um, the san diego zoo Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. you could be walking the san diego zoo and you truly do feel like you're in africa one moment and tropical rainforest another and wild animal park the same way yeah like you know and you know brian's patio you're in rancho bernardo and then all of a sudden it's like you walk into this you feel like you're in costa rica you know you know now is a very weird time of the year because there is virtually almost no sun by 11 o'clock it's just because of well, John talks about the Earth's axis and yeah. all that. Which rotation. We, the it's rotation. all about rotation. So it's just keeping him alive this time of the year and knowing what not to water and what to leave alone. But um, it's interesting what we've created back there. And uh, we're batting about 900, John. Not quite 1,000, but about <laughs> 900 as far as uh, survival of the fittest. Carolyn wishes you a happy birthday and says that her son really liked his chocolate ice cream cake from Baskin Robbins. And I remember carnation ice cream. I used to like carnation ice cream. I remember in Detroit, Stroh's ice cream. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Do you remember Stroh's beer? Stroh's. Yes, Stroh's beer. Maybe that's where I know Stroh's from. Yeah, also uh, Stroh's ice cream. More of the beer, not the ice cream. Right. Um, let's see, who was it? Uh, Kev- Everybody's wishing you happy birthday. Thank you. Veronica in Spring Valley says... Happy birthday. Thank you, one and all. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Any uh, more questions, John? Comments? Yeah, Carla says that she's glad that I mentioned the roses from the auction because she was concerned about hers. Um, so what she doesn't say, though, is whether or not she wants me to mail it to her or she wants to pick it up. Last year she picked it up, mm-hmm. and I think this year she only has one, so... Uh, just let, I'm happy to hold it, Carla, but if you want it sent out, I'll send it out to you on Monday. Because that's just the kind of guy you are. It is. Uh, but I would, I think it's, it'll be safe to send after she gets rid of all the rats and mice around her house. <laughs> and the possums. Good, luck. And, Good yeah. luck with that, right? Yeah. You know, and, and it's funny Justin mentioned possums because possums actually are good, good for your yard. The worst thing they do, I think, to your yard is they dig things up. Because, you know, people talk about... Do they eat grubs? They're they're grub eaters, as you mentioned. They're cockroach eaters. They're tick eaters. Um, They they actually don't eat a lot of plants, from what I hear. Right. Um, So they're not there for the plants. You know, they would would do damage by digging them up. Mm -hmm. But they're there because of the bugs you want to get rid of. So they're actually not bad. And skunks as well. They're not not eating your plants. They're eating the bugs. Raccoons, those are just troublesome in general. How come Kathy thinks you're so much older than you really are? <laughs> she wants to know, and she she's guessing 39. And, oh, yeah? And look what I said. Yes, yes, me and Jack Benny. <laughs> he was perpetually oh, 39 years old. Yeah, just by using that reference, it shows how old <laughs> you are. <laughs> That's, good. Oh. That's good. Yeah, well, I see him on YouTube. Oh, I oh I was yeah, sure. Intro- yeah, introduced sure. to him on YouTube. Tiger sure. doesn't even know who Jack Benny not is. Good. You know who Jack Benny is? No. Really? I mean, probably if you told me something, I, I, he did. Ask your dad. Okay. Ask your dad. Yeah, he. I. John doesn't think he's funny. All he ever he did was, was, was well, well. <laughs> yeah, but it was this right? Yeah, something like that. Great facial expressions, yeah. great comedic timings. Started yeah. in radio, moved on to TV in the fifties. <laughs> Rochester, yeah. sidekick. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. He took very good care of him. You know how much he paid him a year? A huh. hundred thousand a year. Back then? Back then. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Because Benny, Benny's whole thing was how cheap he is. You know, it was a tightwad, didn't want to spend money. 
The opposite was true. He was very generous with his people. Back then, comedians had had a uh, a gig that they just carried on through their whole career. Yeah, that was and it. his was being a tightwad. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. His whole career, that's what he was known for. Yeah. And Bob Hope made his money in real estate. The guy owned everything. I think hmm. he had a brother, I think, who uh, was got to buy land, got to buy property. Hmm. It was right. Got. Palm Springs. Palm Springs, absolutely. Okay, guys, a couple of minutes. Anything else before we uh, say goodbye for this week? What are you going to do for your birthday? You I don't know. I transplant the, Dana. the plant that Dana bought you. Everything's yeah. been transplanted. Everything looks good. Everything is hanging in there. If you want to come over to my house, and pull weeds, I, I've transplant. only gotten half the yard uh, upright and watered. <laughs> i got to go back home and stand up the rest of it. That's never-ending, is it? You know, the these winds, Santa Ana winds, it's just, you know, I was thinking, Tiger, I, I know we're running out of time here, but remember in Michigan, in Michigan, <laughs> um, let me calm down here, when we were in England, remember mm-hmm. they would make those outdoor rooms with hedges yep. and then plant in the center of them? Right. I was thinking of doing that with dahlias, making Ooh. a dahlia bed and having that around it. But <laughs> I'm full thinking, exposure. Why not? Yeah, I'm thinking now with all the, these winds and things, that'll protect, yeah, protect them would. a little bit. What, like a privet? Yeah, something nice like six that. six foot, seven foot tall. Could be something. When's the next yeah. time you're going to get a wind like we had, though? Thursday. Next year. Maybe I could do something <laughs> with the uh, Mexican fence post cactus. Oh. Uh, hey, we got to go, guys. Hey. At the old clock. I would say the All clock right. in the wall, but the clock in my console. Thank you so much. We hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Have a safe weekend. We'll do it again next week right here. Bring your questions, your comments, and uh, anything else you might want to add to the show. Go to our uh, YouTube channel. Go to our website, that's uh, GardenAmerica.com, our YouTube channel, archiving every show. This show will be up and running before the end of today. If you miss something, there's your source. For the entire crew, I'm Brian Main, Tiger Palafox, the Hall of Famer, John Bagnesco. Have a safe weekend, a safe week, and we'll do it again next week right here on Facebook Live and BizTalk Radio.